Today, I'll be discussing the approach to syncope. First, let's define it. It has four components. An abrupt transient loss of consciousness, loss of postural tone, meaning if someone is standing, they fall to the ground, and if they are sitting, they slump down into their seat. It is of short duration, and the person experiences a spontaneous recovery. In addition, syncope may be associated with a prodrome, including lightheadedness, nausea, diaphoresis, and visual disturbances that can precede the loss of consciousness for several seconds to several minutes. The occurrence of a prodrome without a subsequent loss of consciousness is referred to as presyncope. Syncope, presyncope, and isolated transient lightheadedness all exist on a spectrum and have the same etiologies. And all of those etiologies have the same common pathophysiological endpoint. They cause a transient global reduction in blood flow to the brain due to either brief hypotension and or bradycardia. A diagnostic framework for syncope can divide etiologies into three primary mechanisms, reflex, cardiogenic, and orthostatic. Reflex syncope is a heterogeneous collection of etiologies in which syncope occurs as a result of a dysfunctional response of the autonomic nervous system to normal stimuli. The precise mechanism of most of these etiologies is not well understood. There are three clinical subtypes of reflex syncope. The first is called vasovagal syncope, and it's the overall most common cause of syncope. Vasovagal events can occur on account of prolonged standing, emotional stress, or blood draw. It can also be triggered by severe pain, particularly intra-abdominal pain. A second clinical subtype is situational syncope, which is when a specific normal physiologic action recurrently triggers an event. This can be coughing, sneezing, urination, known in this context as micturition, defecation, or post-exercise. The last clinical subtype under reflex syncope is carotid sinus hypersensitivity. This is when a person's baroreceptor reflex, mediated by the carotid sinus near the bifurcation of the carotid artery, responds too vigorously to brief increases in blood pressure to the point that external pressure applied to the carotid sinus results in either vasodilation and or bradycardia. Confusingly, the term vasovagal syncope is also frequently used as a synonym for reflex syncope, encompassing its other clinical subtypes. Cardiogenic syncope is a category which includes all etiologies that are, arise from within the heart. These include both bradyarrhythmias and tachyarrhythmias, although the only tachyarrhythmia that commonly causes syncope is ventricular tachycardia. Most other tachyarrhythmias typically present with palpitations instead. Cardiogenic syncope also includes mechanical etiologies, such as aortic stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and includes the miscellaneous etiology of massive pulmonary embolism. The last major mechanism in our framework is orthostatic hypotension. This is a situation in which a patient's blood pressure drops precipitously upon standing. It is arbitrarily defined as the presence of either a systolic drop of 20 millimeters of mercury or a diastolic drop of 10 millimeters of mercury when moving from the lying to standing position. Orthostatic hypotension can be subdivided into volume depletion from any cause, medication side effects in which alpha blockers, antidepressants, and antipsychotics are the most commonly implicated, and autonomic failure, as seen with Parkinson's disease, diabetes, and alcoholism, along with many other conditions. In addition to our three main mechanistic categories, there is one final category for syncope mimics. These are conditions which can look like syncope, but are not. The most notable one here is seizure, which I'll discuss more in a minute. Vertebral basilar insufficiency occurs when atherosclerosis of the vertebral basilar arterial system causes transient ischemia of the brainstem. Subclavian steel syndrome occurs when atherosclerosis or, or clot in one of the subclavian arteries proximal to the takeoff of a vertebral artery leads to the reversal of flow in that vertebral artery, which then shunts blood away from the basilar artery. Together, vertebral basilar insufficiency and subclavian steel syndrome are sometimes referred to as cerebrovascular syncope. Its semantics as to whether these represent true syncope or syncope mimics, references appear to be split on the issue, 
but they are both rare and should only be considered once other diagnoses have been ruled out. An alcohol blackout can be mistaken for syncope, particularly if the event was unwitnessed. Many medications can cause sedation as a side effect, which occasionally can result in a seemingly abrupt loss of consciousness while an individual is sitting quietly, particularly in the elderly. And finally, there's an entity known as psychogenic pseudosyncope, which is a primary psychiatric issue and typically a form of conversion disorder. Unfortunately, psychogenic pseudosyncope is really hard to diagnose and is particularly hard to distinguish from vasovagal syncope. I'll now talk about the assessment of an individual patient presenting with possible syncope. Where do we start? The most important questions to ask a patient who has syncopized are, what were you doing immediately before you passed out? Did you have any symptoms immediately preceding it? That is, was there a prodrome? Did you injure yourself in the fall? Do you know how long you were unconscious for? When you awoke, how long did it take for you to feel more or less back to normal? And was the event witnessed by anyone? Because the patient themselves cannot be relied on for an accurate answer to those last two questions. We'll now incorporate this information into our diagnostic algorithm. The first step in the algorithm is to consider the duration of loss of consciousness. Loss of consciousness in syncope lasts for seconds to no more than about five minutes. If the person was completely unconscious for longer than this, it probably wasn't syncope. Instead, consider a medication side effect, alcohol blackout, drug intoxication, concussion, narcolepsy, or hypersomnolence related to obstructive sleep apnea, which on occasion really can be that dramatic. Once you determine that the loss of consciousness was transient, then you must differentiate syncope from seizure. There are three main relevant questions to do this. Did the patient have tonic-clonic movements during the loss of consciousness? This is not always as straightforward as it might seem, since patients with syncope can experience non-epileptic myoclonic jerks that can look rhythmic, and it's very common for bystanders, even healthcare professionals, to mistake such movements for seizure activity. Second, was there bladder or bowel incontinence? Bladder incontinence is common, but not universal with a seizure, but can also uncommonly happen with a syncope. Bowel incontinence is a little bit less common with a seizure, but does not happen with syncope. And third, how long was the patient confused for once consciousness was regained. Patients with syncope would usually be confused only for seconds to a couple of minutes, whereas patients who have suffered a seizure usually take more than a few minutes for the confusion to fully resolve. None of these three questions will make a black or white distinction between syncope or seizure, and there will be patients that won't clearly have one or the other after your history. However, as a general rule, patients who have witnessed tonic-clonic movements, bladder plus or minus bowel incontinence, and prolonged confusion after the event, likely had a seizure. And if there were either no tonic-clonic movements or just a few non-rhythmic jerks, no incontinence, and brief post-event confusion, the patient likely had syncope. Also, as a very general rule, syncope is more common than seizure in adults who do not already have a diagnosis of a seizure disorder. If you feel like syncope is the most likely diagnosis, now is the time to consider which general mechanistic category the patient falls into based upon a few key historical questions, the patient's past medical history, a focused physical exam, and their ECG. This is particularly important because cardiogenic syncope suggests the possibility of life-threatening underlying pathology, whereas the only risks from reflex and orthostatic syncope are trauma related to falls during the events. I'll discuss reflex syncope first. Reflex syncope is usually precipitated by a clearly identifiable trigger. It's associated with a prodrome, and that advanced warning of an impending loss of consciousness is usually enough to prevent significant injury during the fall. Patients tend to be younger, and there are no notable risk factors. Exam is usually normal, as is the ECG. If the vasovagal or situational subtypes of reflex syncope are suspected, Additional testing is usually unnecessary, but an ambulatory ECG monitor can be considered, particularly if events are recurrent and relatively frequent. 
Carotid hypersensitivity can be confirmed by carotid sinus massage. Cardiogenic syncope usually has either no precipitant or is precipitated by exertion. A prodrome may either be present or absent. An injury during the fall is common, particularly during events not preceded by a prodrome. Patients affected by cardiogenic syncope tend to be older and have risk factors such as heart failure and coronary artery disease. A family history of early sudden cardiac death suggests a hereditary condition, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or an ion channel defect. On exam, patients with mechanical etiologies of their cardiogenic syncope will often have a pathologic murmur. Possible ECG findings include a current arrhythmia, evidence of ischemia or occult CAD, or evidence of a prorhythmia syndrome, such as a long QT interval or delta waves. If cardiogenic syncope is suspected, a more thorough cardiac exam, an echocardiogram, and an ambulatory ECG monitor are indicated. Let me talk here about the variety of options for ambulatory ECG monitoring. Many patients with cardiogenic syncope will warrant inpatient admission, and for inpatients, they are put on something called telemetry. This is when a patient has several leads attached to their anterior chest wall, which transmit the heart rhythm in real time to a monitor at the nurse's station. For outpatients, the most common ambulatory monitor was formerly a one to two day Holter monitor, but there are several newer options in the US that are relatively inexpensive and which can be left on for a longer period of time. One example is called the Zio patch, which is a waterproof monitor that attaches to the skin over the heart, has no external wires to worry about, and is worn under the clothes for up to two weeks. If an echo and conventional ambulatory monitor both turn out to be unremarkable, yet a cardiogenic cause is still suspected, patients can receive an implantable loop recorder, which is the size of a USB drive, is inserted subcutaneously, and can be left in place for several years in order to catch very infrequent but life-threatening arrhythmias. If the patient then has another syncopal event, the device can be interrogated afterwards to see definitively if an arrhythmia was responsible. The last syncope category is orthostatic syncope. By definition, orthostatic syncope is precipitated by moving from lying or sitting to the standing position. A prodrome is almost always present and injury is uncommon. Patients tend to be older and associated risk factors include Parkinson's disease, diabetes, alcoholism, and new medication prescriptions, particularly for alpha blockers, SSRIs, and antipsychotics. As you might expect, these patients have orthostatic hypotension on exam. Keep in mind that being orthostatic does not necessarily mean that the person's syncope was from the orthostasis, since it's common for older patients with heart disease and on lots of cardiovascular medications to be incidentally orthostatic. Orthostatic hypotension has no relevant ECG findings. If orthostasis is the suspected mechanism, Unless there is a strong contraindication to doing so, give some IV fluids. If the orthostasis resolves, it confirms the patient was dehydrated. If it does not resolve and the patient is on a potentially causative medication, discontinue the med if feasible to do so and reassess orthostatics in a couple of days. If neither hydration nor medication adjustments fix the problem, the patient may have autonomic dysfunction, which will require a more detailed investigation. Historically, there has been a big problem with the overtesting of patients presenting to the hospital with syncope. Patients with low pretos probabilities of dangerous diagnoses found themselves getting serial troponin testing, carotid duplex ultrasounds, brain MRIs, EEGs, all kinds of stuff. But aside from orthostatics, the only other diagnostic test that, that is indicated in all patients presenting with syncope is an ECG. That's the practical diagnostic approach to syncope. Here are the major takeaway points for this topic. The four components of syncope are an abrupt loss of consciousness, loss of postural tone, short duration, and spontaneous recovery. There are many causes of syncope, but they fall into three major categories. Reflex, which includes vasovagal, cardiogenic, and orthostatic. Syncope must be differentiated from syncope mimics, most notably seizure.
Vasovagal syncope is the most common specific etiology, while cardiogenic syncope is the most dangerous general category. And the clinical features suggestive of a cardiogenic etiology are a lack of prodrome, either no precipitant or precipitated by exertion, a history of significant cardiovascular disease, a family history of early sudden cardiac death, a pathologic murmur on exam, and an abnormal ECG.